Well, it's September 27th, 2007. We're in Campbell Hall in Urbana. I'm Jim Meadows, and I'm talking to Merlin Tabor, who lives here in Ch who lives in Champaign. But when you were growing up, where did, where did you grow up, Merlin? I grew up in on a farm in Iowa, mm -hmm. and uh, near Cedar Rapids. Okay. A dirt farm. <laughs> what does dirt farm mean? I've always wondered. Horses. Horses. Uh, I guess meaning you get your hands dirty. <laughs> okay. Now, um, you when when the war began, say say 1949, when the U.S. really got into the war, how old were you? In 39, I was 13 years old. Okay. I had I had uh, moved ahead in school, so I was I graduated from from high school that year. Graduated from high school at age 13. <laughs> Is that right? No, that can't be right. That, of course not. Uh, 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 I graduated from high school at age 17, I'm sorry. I went to high school at age 13. Okay, so were you just entering high school at, in 1939? In 1939, I was going to high school. It was a friend's Quaker boarding school. We had, uh, we had excellent teachers, <laughs> and uh, so they informed us about world events. Now, where was the boarding school? Ohio. Ohio, southeastern Ohio Hills is, is a, a hotbed of Quakerism, if I can put it that way. <laughs> there aren't too many Quakers, but Ohio is one center, and there's so, a boarding school there. So you might have a situation where you would hear one view of the war and the current events, say, back home in Iowa, and then go out to the boarding school in Ohio and hear a different view of the war. Well, I had that situation in my family uh, because my father's side of the family were Quaker, and uh, he's the one who arranged for me to go to boarding school. Uh, I came from a broken home, um, but I was closely in touch with both sides of the family. My mother's family were uh, true blue patriot uh, Midwestern Methodists, and there was a large family, and they were very much uh, in favor of the war, well, not in favor of the war, but they assumed that everyone did military service mm -hmm. and did whatever they could. What was, what was the argument then from the Quaker point of view as to how to regard this war and what people's responsibility was. It wasn't, it wasn't so much this war as war in general. Uh, going back to, the, for most Quakers, it goes back to the teachings of Christ, uh, thou shalt not kill. And uh, I think that as, as uh, Quakers have become more sophisticated, it has be, it has also based on the futility of violence that violence leads to more violence and uh, has side effects that nobody understands and uh, most of my friends, however, when I talk this way, s some of my friends get upset with me because they believe that that it should be a personal conviction that you couldn't use violence against another human being. Every, the Quaker, a centerpiece of Quaker belief says every, every human being is divine. All humans have something of the divine in them. And so you don't kill other people for any reason. Well, you were a teenager, as a teenager at that time, how were you taking this all in? What were you thinking at the time? I think that I'm like most teenagers. I, I wasn't sure what I thought. And at the age of 18, when I registered, I did ask for conscience objector status on religious grounds. But, but I was not at all uh, firmly convinced 
that I personally, and I still am not, that I personally am a, a nonviolent person. Were you thinking at the time, were you torn at the time between um, seeking a CO status and maybe and maybe deciding, well, maybe it's, maybe it's right to, to fight in this war? Yes, I was. And of course, uh, a number of people like me, there's a third alternative, which is to uh, volunteer for medic service in the, in the Army. At that time, at least, you could do that. And uh, they promised you wouldn't carry a gun, although some, uh, some medics did. But uh, quite a few, uh, quite a few religious semi-objectors did that. <laughs> well, what? How did you finally come to make up your mind? I decided that that the argument against killing other human beings, the proscription against killing other human beings, was was a very sound argument logically. And that, uh, and that I was a Quaker uh, in sympathy and at least intellectually. And uh, while I was not sure that I would, could be nonviolent in, in every situation, I thought I'm opposed to taking up arms. So I asked for CO status. And they must, in some way, at least, you know, People's the the general public memory of the war today is that it was a a popular war, and you certainly don't see any Hollywood movies about conscientious objectors. No. <laughs> so how did it feel? Did you feel you were really going against the tide? Yes, I, uh, we. I believe most COs felt like a embattled minority, but of course, we all had support systems in our friends, family, and church pretty much uh, and uh, in in my home county which is Lynn County Cedar Rapids Iowa the, the draft board knew about COs in many counties uh, other other people had the experience of asking for CO status and being refused because the draft board really just simply didn't understand what they were talking about in mm -hmm. uh, in my case, they had had this request before, and they probably personally knew something about Quakers from personal con from living in in that county. And uh, so, after they satisfied themselves that that I had that this was not a last-minute uh, conversion that I had a history of several years of, of uh, participation in, in uh, religious, in peace movements and in religious uh, services and experiences and, had, and was recognized in those circles. When they satisfied themselves with that, then they gave me 4E, conscience objector status. My, uh, when I visited with the family on my mother's side, many of my cousins, probably a half dozen by that time, were already in uniform. And uh, they really had, had, had not the foggiest idea what I was talking about. Uh, and uh, basically, they tried to be polite. They were noncommittal. <laughs> uh, uh, they tried to respect what I was doing if they could, as far as they could. Did you ever have any involved conversations with them about it, or did it just stay on the polite side? It stayed on the polite side. Uh, one of my cousins was in the Navy, and I was closer to him. Uh, he, he talked, he, he said, yeah, oh yeah, I, well, by that time he was committed to a, a medical education. And uh, so he was. He, he said he knew guys in the Navy who were uh, in the medical corps, who were religious, who were COs like I was. So he understood that. So what happened next? You're, you 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 had the status. 
I had the uh, classification and uh, my birthday, this, this all happened rapidly in the winter of, let's see, uh, I became 18 in 1944, uh, late in 1944, and uh, they sent me to Fort Leonard Wood to be, have a physical exam. I also had a mental exam. The psychiatrist asked me if I was close to my mother. <laughs> I think he was uh, working on a personal theory that COs probably had mother fixations. And so he quizzed me about this. And, and uh, other than that, that was non-eventful. Uh, I passed the physical. Soon after that, I was called up. And uh, at the time I was called up, I became subject to the authority of the government, but in effect, they farmed out administration of the CO camps to the peace churches, the three peace churches, Quakers, Mennonites, and Brethren. So those administrators sent me to a camp, decided where I would go. So instead of reporting to a branch of military service like the Army or the Navy, you reported to it was civilian public service? A, a civilian public service camp. And uh, many of them were, well, th these, these were supposed to be work of national importance, which took different meetings. Uh, so there was some argument that these camps should be in remote places because they didn't want these COs propagandizing other people. Uh, Many of the camps had to do with uh, uh, development of infrastructure, roads and dams out west, dirt dams. Uh, later in the war, there were a number of CO, many CO uh, camps or units in mental hospitals because during the war, even the, even the unemployables that med state mental hospitals would find for attendance. Even they were becoming un unavailable because there was such high employment rates. They could get a better job in a factory. So it was uh, mental hospitals, uh, some in some cases general hospitals, even some cases children's homes, but many of them were uh, uh, work in the forest. Uh, my 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 location was a project to develop irrigation facilities along the Columbia River in North Dakota. And uh, so, in early 1945, I was sent to this camp near Trenton, North Dakota, along the along the river, Missouri River. And uh, we, we mixed concrete, shoveled sand and gravel to mix concrete. We made huge pipes, two, three, four feet in diameter for irrigation water. We built roads, irrigation ditches, <coughs> <coughs> partly, partly with machinery, partly by hand. This was a good sized camp. Like a lot of the CPS camps, it was in an old CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. Thank you, Civilian Conservation Corps. Yeah, uh, a, a, a New Deal program of the uh, of the 1930s, and the camps were still around, and uh, some of the men who were employed to run the CPS camps were also uh, honchos or directors from CCC days. Mm -hmm. How was the work? I mean, you, you grew up on a... Mm -hmm. Now, you grew up on a farm, so yes. I imagine you already knew what hard work was like. Yeah. How did this work compare? What was it like? What I was, was... Well, this was hard work. Uh, we got up early had some breakfast, worked long hours. In the evening, uh, 
there was whatever amusement we could create, which wasn't much. <laughs> there were political discussions. The, uh, there must have been, we were occupying 10 or 12, I don't remember, old CCC barracks. And uh, each of the barracks took on a distinctive flavor. There was the New York barrack. There were the uh, Duke of Ors from the northern part of the country. There was us. Duke of Ors. Well, these are a, a semi-communist religious group that, in general, they don't believe in cooperating with the government at all. Mm -hmm. They don't. In fact, they try to live without paying taxes, which is actually impossible, but they do their best not to pay even property taxes on their farms if they can avoid it. Uh, they lead a simple life like the Amish and they try to avoid society. Uh, they were like us, like us Midwest farm boys. They worked hard, the uh, camp managers like them. The New York fellows, uh, they would rather argue than work. <laughs> And uh, uh, who else, what else was there? There was, there were, I encountered a mixture of people, uh, ca some Catholics and other churches. Uh, there were even a sprinkling of men who weren't quite sure how they ended up in CPS. One, one fellow, Good Food Gus, who was a very good cook and worked in the kitchen claimed that he was trying to get into the merchant marine and he claimed he didn't understand how he ended up here in North Dakota, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> what was the flavor of the barrack that you, st that you were in? Midwest farm boys. Uh, and were they, were they people like you, people from Peace Church background? That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, you know, living in a camp with, with that s range of people who were all drawn together by their opposition to the war in some way, did that, was, was, was that new to you at the time? Oh yes, this was, uh, I suppose, in a, a bully adventure for me. Uh, my, my background was very limited of, of travel. I really, I don't think I met any Jewish people, black people, until I got to <laughs> college or, or later. Uh, that's, that's why I was emphasizing being a, a dirt farm kid. Uh, in those days, you didn't travel either. So the state fair was about the farthest away. We farm kids were apt to get. Now, had you had some college at the time you went into the... Yes, I had a year and a half. Where did you go to college? I went to a tiny uh, Quaker college where I could work my way through in southern Iowa. And What's the name? William Penn College. William Penn College. As the name indicates, it had a Quaker background. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, like my boarding school, there were a number of uh, uh, Quaker, active Quaker professors. So again, I was exposed to anti-war thinking and uh, pacifist philosophy in college. So you're, you're, at this, you're at this camp. Um, what was the discipline? Was it military-style discipline, or what was it? Well, it was, yeah, let's see. I, I'm hesitating because I don't know of any disciplinary problems. Uh, well, I mean, just was it, was it very regimented? Did you have to fall in? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the, the daily routine was, was much more like a CCC camp, I suppose. You get up and and uh, yell, people yell at each other, you find something to eat, and then you go to work. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as far as, as the spit and polish, uh, standing at attention, all of those things, no, there was none of that whatsoever. No uniforms. And, and the, of course, the Army wanted nothing to do with these camps. It, they had enough, more than enough headaches without that. And uh, the, the men in CPS and the Peace Churches who were sponsoring them and in fact paying for them, it, it was, a, in a sense, it was a good deal for the government. They got some kind of useful work out of us and they didn't even, they didn't pay us anything. The uh, peace churches paid the costs. 
we had an allowance which could be something, I forget what it was, a few dollars, maybe five dollars a month for spending money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you talked about occupying yourself in the evenings, was there a weekend and did you, was there any place to go? Or where did well, you uh, the, the town of Trenton, I think in, in several months that I was there, I only got to Trenton once or twice <coughs> because <coughs> we didn't have much transportation. And of course, during the war, nobody had gas. And uh, we could get gas for the machines, the road machines and so forth. But uh, as far as private cars, there just, there weren't any. And so you had to f arrange for a ride on a truck uh, to go to town, and it was, as I recall, an hour and a, it was at least an hour away, the nearest town. And it, I suppose it was three or four thousand people. And what sort of reception did people from the CPS camp get in town? Oh, a very cold. So uh, we didn't try to go there too often. Uh, mm -hmm. We, I was, uh, I was given a, a very strange uh, haircut once. Uh, because the barber found out I was at the CPS camp, so he butchered up my haircut as a means of uh, supporting the war. <laughs> mm -hmm. You were at that particular camp for how long? I, th I think I was trying to recall. I think uh, <coughs> <coughs> it was March through May or June. Mm -hmm. It was three or four months. Okay. It's about the time the war in Europe. This is true. Something. The war was already winding down. The uh, Germans had, by that time, I didn't learn this until my reading in subsequent years, but the Germans had basically lost the war by that time in the East. They had lost their best troops and best machinery on the east, the three eastern fronts, and uh, it was, that's true, it, it was winding down. But about that time, you were, were you simply reassigned at one point? I volunteered. They, they put out a call for volunteers to fight fires in Southern California because <laughs> they were also undermanned. They couldn't find any, the Forest Service couldn't find anybody for summer service and they were worried about the fire season. So they recruited volunteer COs around the country and uh, shipped us to Southern California. What made you decide to volunteer? You could have stayed. I think, well, of course it was boring there, but uh, uh, I think it was the, my farm boy. That's why I always tell people I'm a farm boy. I suppose uh, I wanted to see the world and uh, I had never been in California. As far as I can remember, I'd never been, maybe I'd been to Oklahoma, that was the <laughs> farthest west I'd been. So what was the work in California like? Well, there were, there were smoke jumpers, there were uh, different kinds of uh, rangers and firefighters, but, but my particular assignment was to a ranger base in the valley below San Bernardino National Forest, <coughs> near the city of San Bernardino. And we had an old, we had an ancient truck with a 500 gallon drum of water on the back and pumps and hoses and, and a big bench where we sat. A crew of uh, five of us and the driver would speed as far as we could speed in this old truck, which was a it was difficult to get it above 40 miles an hour. We would make haste to the fire and try to put it out. As you can imagine, those fires in that country, uh, if they get away, you have big problems. But if you get, if you can get there in, in the first half hour or so, with a little water, you can put them out. That was our job. Were you, were you successful generally? Or? We were successful in the sense that we put out a lot of fires. Uh, also, sometimes we were trucked up into the uh, forest 
on a bigger fire. Sometimes there were lightning fires in trees up in the forest. So when they were spotted, they'd, they'd call for us, to three or four of us, to go up in a pickup and figure out how to put out this lightning fire, which would be a fire burning in one tree. It might take it a couple of days, but if you left it, it would start a major forest fire. Now, were you staying in barracks the same way that you were? Exactly. Well, these were uh, Forest Service barracks, but they were very similar. And uh, the uh, the uh, forest ranger was was a uh, was a uh, an old cuss <laughs> who was very tough, but also very fair. Uh, he was our basically our boss. He gave us our assignments and. Sometimes he went to the fire with us, sometimes he didn't. Mm -hmm. So the people you would see at the work would be other CPS people? and that There were six here. of us living together in a uh -huh. shack, or I shouldn't say a shack, a barracks, which again was very much like the CPS barracks. One of us turned out he knew how to cook. He was a married man who had experienced cooking. So he was elected cook against his will and uh, he tried to rotate the job uh, uh, when he could, but uh, he cooked. We, had, we ate very well because we had an allowance of, I don't know, a few dollars a week, which in those days actually permitted a good diet. The forest ranger, I mean, did he treat you a certain way because you were CPS? No, I, uh, I think he was like the... Uh, managers that I met in the lost us in North Dakota. He wasn't sympathetic. He as far as he was concerned, he had he had the forest to work about to worry about and uh, if we did a job, good. He wasn't friendly, he wasn't hostile. Uh, he just pushed he pushed us very hard. And he worked very hard himself. Now we're now in that situation where you were again too far from town to get in any place, any, anywhere much? Did I get to? Did you get to town in that case? <laughs> yeah. I, I got to L.A. a few times. I'm laughing because you can imagine my, as a naive farm kid, floating around L.A. and San Diego. Uh, I had some interesting adventures, but uh, I went, when, I, when they gave us a little time off, I would go and try to get a job to make a few dollars and then spend it traveling. And <laughs> I Perhaps I can tell one story. Uh, I, had, I ran into a friend in L.A. I ran into a man who became a friend. He was, uh, he was a black fellow, very good looking, very sharp, very intelligent. He had a, a master's degree in Spanish from Harvard University. And uh, as I say, he was very attractive. And he and I cooked up a plan. We had about 15 or $20 between us to go down in the Baja Peninsula and spend a couple days in Mexico. Uh, on the way, we hitchhiked to San Diego. We went into, a, near the waterfront, we went into a greasy spoon near the waterfront, sat down at the counter, and ordered coffee and a hamburger. I noticed that other people were being waited on who came in after we did. I began to look around. It sunk, gradually sunk into my head that we were in, basically in the South, and he was black and I was white, and they weren't going to serve us. And when I looked at him, I realized he had seen, naturally, he'd seen us a long time before I had. And first I, I asked, I called the waitress over and said, what's the matter? And she said, she was very embarrassed. I'm sorry, we can't serve you. I started, I, when I looked at uh, my friend, uh, uh, his name was Sidney, as I recall. I said, Sidney, should, should we make a fuss about this? He didn't want to, understandably. He, wa he wanted to get out. So we found a a greasy spoon in a worse neighborhood. That was San Diego. This was my first personal introduction. As I say, I was a naive farm kid. This is my first personal introduction to 
And that was San Diego. That was not the Jim Crow South, but that was the way This is San it Diego. Well, but that was the way things this were. This is wartime. There were sailors everywhere. Uh, a lot of the sailors were from the South. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we we crossed the border and took a uh, broken down bus south into Mexico. We happened to hit this town, found a, a hotel for three dollars a night we could afford. Uh, it it turned out that they were having the high school prom dance the very night that we arrived. So we looked at each other and decided to go. My friend, to make a long story short, the the lady, the lovely girls were sitting around the edge. Every one had one or two uh, chaperones sitting up behind them and watching like a hawk. The men, the boys, were on in one corner, and they would scatter out and try to try to try to get somebody to dance with them. My friend was the hit of the ball. He was the <laughs> bell of the ball. Now this was in Mexico. With his looks, his ability to speak Spanish, uh, and being a stranger, and a very good dancer. He, he, was, he was the center of, of envious attention. I was uh, the only, uh, the only, uh, white person in the, well, not white, the only North, North American pasty-faced person. And I tried, he taught me what to say to ask someone to dance. I tried three or four and gradually it sunk through my thick head that, uh, that, I, was, uh, that I was poison from the looks I was getting. So I became more and more uncomfortable and then I told my friend, Sydney, I'm going back to the hotel, I'll see you later. <laughs> so. This was my, i sorry to take so long, but it was my farm boy introduction to race relations. Mm -hmm. Now, was, was Sidney from the CPS camp? Probably Not Sydney. from a different one. I, I don't even remember where he was, but okay. we just bumped into each other, I think, at, the, at some kind of Quaker Center <coughs> where we could get a bed for $2 a night mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. We teamed up for this trip. Did you ever see him again after that? Yes, I saw him. We kept in touch for two or three years. Then, then he, then we, we both started families, and we lost touch. Mm -hmm. You were uh, so you spent a certain amount of time in California on the on the uh, brush fire detail. Was there? We, we spent the f the fire season, and uh, at the end of the fire season, they wanted to get rid of us. <laughs> uh -huh. They didn't, <coughs> the Forest Service didn't really want us around, or they didn't want extra men around in the winter. And uh, so I volunteered again. Uh, a call came for volunteers for medical experiments, and this was a medical experiment in uh, Philadelphia. I volunteered to be a guinea pig in a jaundice, a yellow jaundice, hepatitis A experiment. Now that's a lot different from just doing work. Um, yes, it's very different. We why, spent <laughs> why did you volunteer for that? Well, I'm, I'm sorry to sound so naive, but I was naive. I volunteered as much as anything else to see the East Coast. Uh, and I suppose like, like every young man in high school age and after for at least a year or two, most young men, they, want, they feel a need to prove themselves. And I think I wanted to prove that I wasn't afraid of anything and was willing to do anything. And uh, So you went out, this, this took you out to where now? Philadelphia. Okay. And wh where we did they set you up? Specifically, we, in this case, our unit, <laughs> was in an old deke. The deke was a drinking fraternity on the, the Penn campus. And so it was a very beat up old fraternity house. And they had set up this unit, which was supervised by an, a research doctor from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. And uh, this experiment I took part in, I'd, I only found out later, there was a total of somewhere 40, 50 or more 
men who were in various units of this experiment at Yale and also at Pennsylvania. My particular unit was only about <coughs> a dozen men in this fraternity house. We had a nurse who uh, took blood and, and kept track of our general condition. Uh, we, were, we were closely supervised because they didn't want us wandering around catching other diseases. So we spent a lot of time sitting in in this building, this old decrepit building, they didn't and want reading. You wandering around, they only wanted you to catch one disease. I think. <laughs> they wanted us to catch hepatitis. I was in the experimental group, the X group, uh, which caught hepatitis. And uh, incidentally, only recently I found out that Everett Koop, who was later uh, our national doctor, uh, was connected. He worked as a young man. He worked on that experiment. He said he was very shocked to learn that the uh, that these CO guinea pigs didn't have any idea about the dangers that they were undergoing, and in fact, several young men died from from having hepatitis because they, especially early, they didn't know how to treat it, and uh, so he took part in post-mortems on some, uh, looking at the livers of some men who died from yellow jaundice. Uh, and this affected his later thinking about human subject policy. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So you were actually putting yourself at some risk. I didn't have a clear picture of that, how much at the time, mm -hmm. but yes, I was. Now this was, you said, uh, the Penn, was it what, University of Pennsylvania? or Pennsylvania Yes, it was. Basically, it was supervised by a doctor, and I'm sorry to say, I've, I've, I've looked up his publications announcing his findings. Uh, he, as it happens, he's a Quaker himself. That's how he hit on the idea of recruiting some uh, COs to be subjects. But he developed his own theory about what spread uh, hepatitis, which proved to be correct, namely that human waste, it spread through human waste. So those of us in the experimental group uh, had to uh, ingest, that is, drink some human uh, urine or mixture of feces from people who had yellow jaundice. Diluted, I would assume. Diluted. We didn't. Again, I didn't. We didn't know that at the time, but I knew. We knew it didn't taste good. Okay. It was diluted and flavored. <laughs> so, you know, you came out there to see Philadelphia. But you yes. couldn't have seen too much if you were if you were well, sick. I saw a little bit, <laughs> and uh, after we after we contracted the experimental group, every one of us, I think in that case it was probably five or six people, and every one developed a beautiful yellow case of yellow jaundice, which they now call hepatitis A, and uh, they told us they warned us. <coughs> After a few, after a week or two, you're going to feel like you've recovered, but you haven't recovered. Your your liver is very sensitive. Don't do anything. Don't even do anything as strenuous as as dancing. Because this is why the army had losses from jaundice. Uh, the, they put the men back in the line after a week or two because they seemed to be okay. But then they had a relapse and died. And so they warned us that we needed a long period of recovery for our livers to recover. But being, again, a, a farm boy, I wanted some money to do things around Philadelphia. We had more liberty at that time. So I took a job which involved carrying boxes, which were fairly heavy. I suppose that's the reason probably that I uh, I did pass out and fell and fractured my skull. So then I had another learning experience, which was to be on the uh, public charity ward of the Philadelphia City Hospital. There was no money, of course, to send me someplace else. So, so I, got, I joined the, uh, the drunks and the poor people 
in the public ward, and this was very educational. <laughs> Did you still have the jaundice? And, well, you still had the weak liver. Well, I, yeah, I guess so. But by that time, I had I realized I had to look take care of myself. Mm -hmm. So at least I was more careful. Being at a public charity hospital, um, you said, well, well, what did you learn? Well, it was a room about the size of this space, which had uh, something like 40 beds, and they were side by side. So you had somebody in the next bed that could be a victim of a knifing or terminally ill or anything. And uh, the, uh, the doctors from the medical school uh, brought around bunches of students to look at us periodically. And I suppose we probably received good medical care and supervision. There was one, one nurse uh, who was a large, loud-spoken woman and very, she ran the, she tried to run the ward like a, like a top sergeant. Um, I think that she, she herself was mainly responsible to look, to be sure everything was, everybody was behaving themselves and taking their medication. And aside from that, uh, we were dressed in hospital gowns, so we, we couldn't go anywhere, but uh, we generally sat in our bed and talked to each other or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I made friends there with uh, a couple of, of uh, guys, including a black guy. I went, my, my girlfriend and I went to visit him, uh, uh, and I kept in touch with him for a while. Uh, but uh, after that, uh, they wanted to get rid of us. I volunteered, or they sent me. By well, that time, it was. Uh, um, I tried to I tried to recapitulate this. I suppose by that time it was late summer, maybe 1946. So the war was over. The war and uh, the war was over. Some people were being discharged, but there was still uh, no. It wasn't 46. This time it was uh, 19. Well, Late summer of 1945. So the war was just ending. The war. In, in, yes, in the Japan. war was wine was ending, okay. and uh, but nobody had been discharged yet by that time. Although it began to happen soon after, for discharges from CPS that is for guys who had been in quite a while. Mm -hmm. They sent me to Byberry Mental Hospital. Where's that? <coughs> that was. A, a very large st state mental hospital in northwest, northeast Philadelphia. It became famous actually as a snake pit. A, uh, it, films from Byberry were used to good effect in the mental hygiene movement, trying to reform mental health care after World War II. And uh, it was the place was used as a bad example, I take it. Yes, it was, it was, uh, there were 6,000 patients. There were two or three physicians to provide whatever medical care there was. There were, I don't know what, 20, 30 nurses, registered nurses, and then uh, lots of attendants. But during the war, they couldn't find attendants. Uh, normally, they didn't find good people to work there. I mean, they, they put it, they had always put up signs out in the highway nearby Barry trying to hire people. They would hire people off the, off the street. So as a result, they, they got uh, many drunks and others who were unemployable. Anyway, uh, the buildings were very run down. The buildings were huge, but they were very run down. Uh, something like uh, 20 to 30 percent were elderly people, uh, burned out cases of schizophrenia or syphilis, which was still widespread at that time. Uh, I was assigned 
There was one building which was called the Incontinent Building. As you can imagine, this was because uh, 250 people or so there could not control their bowels or their, or their urine. And uh, I was glad not to be assigned to that building. I was assigned to the Violent Building. This had 150 or 200 men, each of whom had either usually had attacked attendants or other patients repeatedly or who had escaped repeatedly. So they were put in this building. And my, my most memorable experience from that is uh, the long days that I spent, probably 12-hour days, in the what was called the day room, I euphemistically called the day room. This was a large thing about the size of a basketball court where 125 or more men who were all had a history of violence uh, were milling around and there were two of us young naive CO people at one end of the room and we put a row of benches across the room and told the men they couldn't come across the benches. And we stood there and watched what, what was happening. And then we would go, one of us would go, or two if needed, to break up fights, which broke out all day long. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the way you spent time, except for the times when they went, you had to help herd them to the dining room. And during the daylight hours, since they, we didn't have enough people to manage to take these patients outside and uh, they couldn't be trusted not to run away. Uh, during the daylight hours, they were in this large room, day room, all day long. And we, we had something like 12 hour shifts uh, watching them. And as you can imagine, I began smoking. That's where I contracted a smoking habit that lasted 20 or 30 years. Was was that was that one of the more difficult jobs in terms of I mean nothing you did was easy but that sounded like it was filled with a lot more tension for you. Well, it was a very unpleasant job. I don't I don't know whether to call it difficult or not. Yeah, it was difficult to to manage these guys. They were very unpredictable, and uh, it, some of them managed to hang on if they could. They'd hang on to. Um, a piece of metal or a utensil from the dining room and sharpen it on concrete and then try uh, uh, attack us or attack somebody else. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was difficult. Uh, uh, I think that being a humane, uh, do-good type, well-intentioned person and being naive, as I keep saying, uh, I mainly felt sorry for these patients, and uh, I thought it was a shame the way they were being treated. And uh, this this did carry over. I, de in fact, decided I would try to have a career in uh, developing mental health, better mental health services, and I did. So that that particular that particular duty really shaped your professional life. It really affected the rest of my life up till today. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, uh, the kind of work I did and where I went to s graduate school and so on and so forth. Did you, were you able to play a role professionally or did you at least see changes so that people with, with, people with those particular conditions are treated differently or better now? Well, here in Illinois, uh, I, I got grants to, to develop, to try to help the state or nonprofit organizations develop home care programs and community care programs. I got, I studied the attempts to develop community care here in Illinois in 1970s, I guess it was, 30 or 40 years ago. Actually, Illinois was one of the leaders, one of the most visible leaders in the nation in attempting to develop strong regional and local services and 
and there was a development. Uh, and in fact, most of the old state mental hospitals in Illinois have been closed and put to other uses. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was somebody who was around, not a foremost player because that had to be the policy makers in, in Springfield and, and uh, the people that controlled the state money. But uh, certainly I knew all of these people and I made reports, I wrote reports, I testified, I, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I had, a lot of, I had a series of grants and employed graduate students from sociology, social work, and psychology. In a, and many of them went on to work in this area too. All this time you were in the CPS, were you writing home or were you, you know, writing to anybody in, in, in the family and letting Oh yes, I kept in touch uh, with letters. What did you tell them? Pardon me? What did you tell them in the letters? <laughs> well, I tr tried to tell them what I, I guess, what I thought they would like to hear of, of my experiences, yes. Some things you deliberately kept out. Oh yes, my like any uh, like the servicemen from that time. I'm sure uh, there was a lot of self censorship in writing, mm -hmm. but uh, also, and when I was in California, for example, one of my mother's sisters was nearby because she taught in an Indian school in Riverside, which was right near. I went and visited her a couple of times, and. Uh, uh, I told her she had she had that family's attitude toward medical sir or toward, excuse me toward the importance of doing your military service. Uh, I told her what I was doing, and she looked out the window and said, "Well, that's better than nothing, I guess." <laughs> but uh, you must have been you must have been reminded a lot then that you weren't getting the same sort of respect that you would have gotten if you had been wearing a uniform. Well, I think those of us in CPS didn't expect it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't expect to get the respect. Uh, and let's face it, we didn't appreciate it. I would say after the war, let me add that uh, another, another impact that this experience had on me was aside from my career, in my heart and mind to spend, I suppose, the next 60 years examining, was I a pacifist? What did I believe? Everyone has this problem of self-examination, but it was, I think that the fact that I didn't join in defeating Germany when, I, when that was the, the thing to do, uh, this was, this, question was sharpened for me when I was a graduate student. I had a buddy who was a, a photographer f for the Milwaukee newspaper and had served several years with the army and went and traveled with the army across Germany, traveled with Eisenhower's army. And one evening he opened a trunk and took out literally dozens of pictures, enlargements, of death camp, of a death camp. He was a member of the forward troops that liberated this death camp. And he documented it. He took pictures. He, he was shocked, of course, shocked half to death. But he took, he took pictures by the hour. He had dozens. And he and I looked at those. That was my first exposure to what what the death camps were. I think now that everybody knows or everybody who's educated or who reads newspapers knows about the Holocaust. But in fact, in this country, somehow we, we were very slow to come to terms with what had happened even at the time. <coughs> and, I, and even though I was a graduate student, I didn't have a, at all a clear idea. And of course, when I looked at these pictures, I thought, shouldn't I have helped to fight the Nazis who did this? And I would say that this kind of thinking in general led me to many years, which continues to the present, of reading 
of trying to read world history and a variety of uh, histories of World War II and, and the wars, our, our, our other oil wars since then, to read these histories. And uh, you consider World War II to some extent an oil war? Well, Hitler lost the war in the East. Why did he go East for oil? Mm -hmm. He probably, why was England able to withstand the Blitz? Actually, I think most historians would agree that probably it was because Hitler ran out of oil for his planes and other machines. And if he had had all the oil he wanted, probably England couldn't have survived as it did, as well as it did, which was by the skin of its teeth. Mm -hmm. uh, why did Japan attack the U.S.? Oil. They saw us as cutting off their access to oil in, it, in the south. South and, of? Uh, well, the Philippines and Indonesia, that's where, they, that's where their oil came. So they wanted to protect it. Our Navy was. Okay. I think, excuse me. Um, but we're talking, you, you, were, you, you became a sort of student of the, a student of, of the war. I was enlarging on the idea that, that one way that, that my World War II experience affected the rest of my life was making me ask myself, am I really <laughs> a conscience objector? Am I a pacifist? What sort is of it? Like, sort of like questioning your own faith. Yes, and, and, yes, and my own, and my own b behavior. My wife or any of my friends can tell you I'm not a nonviolent person, <laughs> uh, um, really. And uh, I think I know that. And I, I think that this reflection and reading has led me to a, a much more firm conviction that that I am a, a pacifist, partly, but I have to say it's partly on religious grounds and it's partly on, it's partly on the grounds that human life is sacred, but it's also on the grounds that, that war is self-defeating and violence is always self-defeating because of the, of the way histories are written and because of Hollywood, uh, most people don't think of violence, violent war as being self-defeating. But way, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But it is. Now you must have run against, up against the argument that in the case of World War II, the U.S. was defending itself and its allies against aggressors, and so even uh, against violent aggressors. Yes. You would say that a, um, a violent defense is not the way. It's this not is the a way tough to case. The only thing I can say is that uh, it was clear to a lot of people in in the 1938 and 39 that Hitler should be stopped. But, uh, but a lot of national leaders refused, dealt with Hitler, refused to, refused to place limits on him. And he saw the opportunity and, and uh, he left the reservation. He got out of control. <laughs> Now, would, wouldn't those limits themselves have been violent? I mean, that would have required some sort of force. Uh, at, at an early stage, not necessarily. There were, there's, uh, there's simple international approval. There's also economic constraints. And uh, there were a lot of the rest of the world, including Switzerland, my wife's country, uh, which has tried to come to terms with that lately. And the United States, some of our businesses, which have never been willing to come to terms or admit, a lot of them continued to do business with Germany mm -hmm. into the war. And there is some thinking, I don't know whether it, how sound it is, that, that our strategic bombing was selective in avoiding pro certain properties in which there was an American interest. My point is that this has never, this has never been, this has never come out. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> and, and my point is that uh, there, 
it's the same as the Civil War. It looks to us now in hindsight, well, we had to fight because of the South, but recent histories of John Brown, a, bi a biography I wrote of John Brown. You, you read or you wrote? Mm -hmm. You said you wrote or? You... I wrote. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I think I'll have to, we'll have to wind up this interview and I'm uh, beginning to, maybe I'm beginning to, uh, anyway. Uh, well, the John Brown biography, what did it tell you? John Brown was a terrorist, that's what I'm saying. And I think some recent biographies have portrayed this clearly. And before John Brown, uh, abolitionism was not respectable among in, intelligent, well, people like Mark Twain, intelligent liberal leaders in this country and politicians. Uh, he, through his violence, he provoked fear and violence in the South, and, and he ex particularly exacerbated the idea that he was, because he said, I'm going to go down and raise a slave army. They would love to, get, to rise up and, and fight against the Southerners, and I'm going to make this happen. Well, you know, this kind of talk is uh, inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that nobody can revisit history and say what could have happened. But at the time, and, and even now, some historians think that there could have been, there was a political solution, and it could have led to abandonment of slavery in the South. If conditions had not been inflamed by actions such as abolitionists well, like John Brown. Well, he certainly helped create a situation where that political accommodation was impossible. Mm -hmm. So the, these are some of the thoughts that this is how your thought has developed Which is, since, since the war. I think this is an unusual preoccupation for an old guy like me and for for middle class people in general, but yes, it's been a lifetime preoccupation because of my World War II experience. Even though I was a farm boy, what I did was not significant one way or another. I came in late in the war. Uh, if I had joined the army, let's face it, that wouldn't have made any difference either. I would have been, as a friend of mine, a classmate of mine was cannon fodder for Eisenhower's march across uh, France, and uh, he, he only he he enlisted at about that time, and so he only lasted a week and a half after landing in France before being killed as an infantryman. And my story would have been the same probably, mm -hmm. without making much difference one way or the other. By that time, the war was determined. But in in my mind. <laughs> This is an important distinction, and it's something that's preoccupied me ever since. I want to go back um, to your CPS duties and the uh, work at the mental hospital. Was that your final assignment? Yes, it was. So what happened then? I went back to school and finished my bachelor degree. Now, what, do you get, what do you get from CPS? I mean, if, if you serve in the military, you get a discharge hopefully an honorable discharge. Oh, we, we had, a, let's see, we had a discharge, I guess, but. <laughs> a little certificate somewhere saying that? I suppose I got one, I don't know. Or maybe it was a letter saying, you can go now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Incidentally, I, I was the one who, uh, I'm sure I didn't do a good job, but they told me to organize the office and organize the paperwork and send it, send it in and close the unit at Byberry. I was the one who was there at the end and closed it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I did at the end of the end of CPS. And then I went back to school. Uh, two years later, I got a... I, back to William Penn? I, instead of majoring in physics, I majored in sociology, which led no place. <laughs> So, but that was your career, wasn't it? it well, yeah. It, actually, uh, it became my career. I, after I got my bachelor's, I was 
I had taken some teaching courses, but I didn't really want to teach. So I, I took a teaching job in northern Iowa, then told him I wasn't coming because I just couldn't face it. I didn't enjoy teaching. And uh, I worked in a factory and, and as a carpenter, and then went back to school uh, and, so, and learned, got a master's degree in social work. But then I got uh, the University of Iowa hired me for a, a project. So I took the opportunity to go back to school again and get a doctorate, doctorate in sociology, which legitimized me to spend a career in research and so forth, which I have done. Mm -hmm. You could have stayed with physics. Well, how do you think your life would have been if you had done that? Uh, I think uh, I think I would have been working for the Defense Department one way or another because, let's face it, everybody in the sciences works most, well, I shouldn't say everybody, mostly. Uh, nobody looks too closely, but mostly they work for some a aspect of uh, the defense industry or the defense budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I didn't want to do that. Did you stay in touch over the years with people you knew in CPS? I mean, I don't know if there's any, or are yes. there any organizations for that group like there are like oh, there are veterans organizations? Well, some some people uh, have, and some churches have tried to stay in touch. Uh, there, I'm I'm not a reunion person, <laughs> and. Uh, I think the people that I knew in CPS, I've stayed in touch with, are people that probably I knew aside from CPS, that is, from my school before or after. Uh, as far as these, as far as Sydney that I traveled with and other people I did things, uh, I can't, actually I thought about that in trying to remember what's happened. I don't believe there were any lifetime connections that grew out of CPS. Mm -hmm. For some of my friends, I know there have been. For me, not. Mm -hmm. It may have been because I moved so much. I don't know. Okay, so that, because you, you kept on having to break off. And the people I worked with were, were <laughs> I was sort of a transit and so, that, so were they, and they went on to other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them were very congenial, people that I liked a lot, but I didn't stay in touch long. Okay. Over the years, were you ever called upon, asked to, 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 to talk about those days, or was that something that people just didn't, weren't interested? No, I haven't. I haven't been called upon. Uh, I've been a peace activist. Uh, I, I decided that, that the, uh, through simple survival, that, that is, there are so few people left who who uh, were, who grew up or who were adults during World War II. Uh, my experience has become more interesting to others perhaps because I'm unusual. There aren't very many of us left who, mm -hmm. who uh, served in CPS, same as, same as military service. So for instance, and I don't know if you were, in, if, if you were active in opposition to the Vietnam War. Yes, I, excuse me, but uh, in fact, an aftermath of CPS was that they re they cranked up the draft again for for the uh, Korean War in 1950, and uh, I, in fact, I had traveled to Washington a couple times with others to to uh, lobby our congressman against the draft, but of course that it it, it went into effect. I wrote a letter to the Des Moines Register. I was uh, working or teaching in Iowa at that time. I wrote a letter to the Des Moines Register and explained it was a long, <coughs> a long winded letter to explain why I would not. I was refusing to register because I objected to the war. And a couple of, uh, of men in black suits showed up around my home village of Whittier, Iowa, and interviewed people about who I was and what kind of a person I was. So I suppose the FBI looked into my case and decided I wasn't a good test case. 
because I was never arrested, although I could have been. In the Vietnam, again, I was, I did everything I could to oppose it. Stood up, I stood up with others to hold up signs. I wrote, I telephoned, I gave money. Mm -hmm. Were people in the peace movement at all curious about the fact that you had uh, resisted the war in World War II? Uh, not particularly, <laughs> no. Perhaps, as I say, recently, because I, because I remember World War II, that's a little bit interesting. <clears throat> I was asked to give a talk. Uh, it was at the Champaign Public Library. Uh, I was asked to be on a panel with two or three other speakers uh, because of my World War II CO experience. This is recent? Oh, it was tr uh, three or four years ago. And w did people seem curious then? Uh, well, they listened. I, <laughs> uh, I don't, I can't, I don't, uh, I guess, I think I said this to you, uh, Jim Meadows, before the interview, that uh, I'm sure I'm like the veterans you interview. I don't know why anybody would be interested in this experience, I suppose. Mm -hmm. that's, that's always been my opinion. And uh, uh, I, I haven't expected that people would find it instructive. I think among anti-war people, you, you have a group of individualists. <laughs> Everybody has their own angle on why they're against war and their own experience. And it's, it's highly variable. Everything from seasoned uh, Vietnam veterans to... Uh, uh, everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking back about you know all the experiences you've had in the CPS and all the things you told me, what was the most, di what was the hardest thing you did? What was the most difficult or harrowing experience? Going you? through that? Yeah. Oh. I suppose the most harrowing was my experience in the mental hospital to see uh, to see people who are well. For example, I was I had to change the bed for a man who was had had syphilis for many years. When I picked him up, I realized he was hollow, literally hollow. Mm -hmm. He weighed about fifty or sixty pounds, and. Uh, to pick up somebody like that and realize this is a human being who's a ho literally a hollow shell and he's still living, barely, uh, and to, to see things like that, to, uh, to see the, well, in the, I, I mentioned being in the violent building, there was a, there was a ward in the violent building, B-26, and uh, all of us had to help over there once in a while. These were the most violent of the violent men. And a number of them were beautiful. There's no other word for it. Heroic and beautiful physical specimens because they were black men who were in the boxing game in Philadelphia. And they had become hooked on drugs, undoubtedly from painkillers, morphine, and so forth. They'd become addicts and had in, needed more and more drugs and had uh, gotten in trouble because of that. But they still, several of them still had their strength and their physique from boxing days. And uh, these men, this was another uh, Horrifying. I think you did use the term horrifying. This is another very difficult experience to see these men chained, li chained to their beds. They were literally chained. They were literally. They had manacles around their wrists and some of them around their feet as well. Uh, Big John, <laughs> who who never gave us any trouble. If he had, it would have taken four or five of us to handle him. Mm -hmm. He was a large-sized heavyweight boxer. But his hands were chained to his bed. He 
from years of taking drugs, his mind was, was really in bad shape, but he was very friendly. And he had learned that he could, since his feet were not manacled, he could put his feet over the edge. He picked up his bed and put it over his head and went around and, and greeted people and the attendants. Hello, he said. How are you today? Hello. It was, it was like uh, an old lady making the rounds of her friends at tea time. He wanted to nod and say hello to everybody. And uh, that was Big John. But then there were others. That was another horrifying, that word in general. And when the, once one of the men had to be taken to the hospital, he was a, he was a boxer who was an excellent, still in excellent condition, and a, and a serious drug addict. He had to be taken to the hospital for something he needed very badly. The nurse wanted to give him a sedative. He knew that this sedative, he, he wanted, well, she was trying to give him the sedative in one arm. He was trying to get the needle as a weapon and uh, it wouldn't be, make much of a weapon, but he wanted it. So he was flexing his muscle and taking the other hand. And there were four of us CO guys trying to hold his arms and legs, and we couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. We had to, we had to uh, as I recall, they finally gave up on the whole project. What sort of drugs were these, had these people been addicted I to? I couldn't them? say. I was, uh, I assume, I say morphine because I've only become acquainted at all with drug problems the last 20, 30 years. At the time, I was totally uninformed. I didn't know, I didn't understand anything. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I assume that all of them had, well, they all had injuries from boxing, and I suppose uh, that mor- morphine and others were used to kill the pain and possibly right. to and permit them to keep boxing. I don't know, okay. but I'm just guessing. Now, I I hadn't asked. Were you an only child? Did you have or did you have any siblings? I had a brother and a sister. And did your brother go and go into the service? My brother came along later. He was a CO in the in the Vietnam. Your younger brother. My younger brother. Okay. Uh, he, yes, and he, he did alternative service, and he ran into unfriendliness, then also, acceptance. But uh, he had, yes. Did he did he come to you with questions about dealing with that sort of stuff? No. Uh-huh. No. My, uh, incidentally, my grandfather was, uh, my great grandfather was a CO in the Civil War. <laughs> uh, my father was CO in World War I, but being a farm boy, he was never called up. Mm-hmm. His family needed him. So this is really a family tradition of taking this it's, road. On my father's side, there's a, a long history okay. of uh, being Quakers, and this is part of it. Now, have you had any kids yourself? My son, David, uh, I believe he he got CO classification that wasn't his number didn't come up in. And that would have been during when? Yeah, when was that? Was that in Vietnam? Or Must have been. During, in the 1960s? Maybe my brother wasn't a, didn't come along. He, he must, maybe that must have been in the Korean War when he was called, I don't know. Okay. So both your brother, you, you, your, your brother was a CO who did service. Anyway, he was a CO. Your son was, was, was would have been the Vietnam War era? Yeah. Okay. So no dissenters. It sounds, at least on your father's side, um, um, there's, um, or in, or else you could say that you were all dissenters. <laughs> um, well, no. There's. Uh, you're right. Mm-hmm. On the on my father's side, and on my mother's side, uh, among my cousins and so forth, uh, uh, there's no COs. Mm-hmm. No trace of that kind of thinking. So the, the split in the family then that way was, was, was... I have very many very good friends among the, 
those cousins on the mother's side, but but uh, they're not pacifists. Mm -hmm. But it was something that was just really very strong. It sounds like with everybody on on, on your dad's side. Well, with you. remember that I went to uh, <clears throat> boarding school. Mm -hmm. I was raised. I went to Quaker meeting when I was small. I heard the talk, but I went to boarding school for four years and then to a Quaker college. And I, so, yes, I heard a lot about it. And it's something that's, and, it, and it's something that, that, that really seems to really stick with people. I'm thinking it wasn't because I'm wondering that maybe the, the, the popular example. I think there was even an old Gary Cooper movie where he played yes. a Quaker who um, <laughs> he decided he had to take up the gun. I believe, yeah. And that might seem to be the the popular picture for people who are not who are not from the Peace Churches. Uh, well, that this doesn't really have any staying power. I never really thought about it, but uh, I don't really know of any cases. I, maybe there are of people who who were serious COs and then decided, this is all a mistake, I should, I should be carrying a gun and enlisted. I suppose there must be, but I, I, I think I would have, should have heard of them, but I've never heard of any. So even though it, it sounds a little bit like, you know, swimming upstream in terms of popular opinion in this society, there's enough to sustain people to keep on doing I it. I think, well, I, I've, I think, uh, Everyone, I'm sure you know, and everyone knows that uh, once you take a position, <laughs> to some extent, you may become stronger because you have to re you have to justify having taken that position. And maybe there's a fa maybe there's an element of that in my own story. There probably is, mm -hmm. but uh, aside from that, I don't know of people. Uh, I'm sure there are people who have deserted the, the uh, CO position. I don't know of any myself. Mm -hmm. For people today, what do you think people should know about your experience? What's the important thing that they need to know? What I think is important is something that has, has burdened my mind. Uh, I know there's nothing whatsoever I can do about it. But it increasingly has bothered me because there's so much evidence that that these young men who are volunteering for military service or the National Guard, they are disproportionately low income and perhaps disproportionately small town young men. And they're certainly disproportionately low income. They have, they have a mixture, I believe, of, of hopefulness that they're going to find a career, they're going to be useful, uh, they're, they're going to serve their country, quote unquote, and at the same time, uh, uh, my neighbor, who's a dear friend, is proud of his military service, and he's pushed his son into it with, with this kind of thinking. And in my, in my own family, I have people like that. I think that these, I think these young men don't have the faintest idea what they're getting into. And we in the peace, on the peace movement side, we do hear from hundreds, if not thousands of men who have simply walked away, who have tried to get CO status, or who are very unhappy, I think in some cases probably are mentally, become mentally disturbed because when they find out what they've gotten into, they realize this is not for me. How do I relate this to my experience is that when I went into to CPS, I was not at all sure of my, that that's what I should do. But because, as you have just, as you have just uh, brought out, because of my family and family friendly connections and a history, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And so my life has has been very different, for better or worse, in that 
in this direction. And these young men, I feel, they're getting into something way over their head. For some of them, it was completely intolerable and unacceptable. They don't know that they're going to be trained to become cold-blooded killers. And do you think maybe today in this war that because there is no draft that, that this quest, these questions are being raised even less because it's so easy to avoid military service? I have service. to say that everything about this war is political and there's no draft for political reasons because if we had a draft there would be no war. That's very clear. I think everybody sees that. Mm -hmm. The war wouldn't last a week. Today, when you talk about these issues with people who, can you talk about these issues with people you, who, who, who uh, don't agree with you? Increasingly, uh, the man in the street, if there is such a creature, the average guy has more and more question. That's very clear. We see that in public opinion polls, newspapers. Mm -hmm. And even, I shouldn't say this, but even journalists are catching on. I shouldn't say this to a man who's a journalist. But your own experience in talking to people, um, can you talk about these issues? It's changed. Uh, yes, I can. And much more easily than two years ago, if that's what you're wondering. So like when, when, when the war in Iraq first began, was it hard to bring up you know, your, own, your, your own ideas? There was a knee-jerk reaction, uh, which historians and, and militarists too understand very well. Oh, you have to support the president. You have to support the war. You can't be against it. And we have, to, which translates, we have to support our troops as if we're doing them a favor to send them over there to get killed for nothing. Mm -hmm. But now, now at least today. Other people are seeing this the way that I have just described. They're being killed for nothing. I think an increasing number of military, of the parents of young men are being sent back because the politicians are not willing to institute a draft because they know that will be the end of the war. Mm -hmm. the, people, the people in the White House need this war and they're not going to give it up. Mm -hmm. In the long haul, I mean, looking because looking back on the ex, on, on your own experience and the conflicts that the U.S. has been in since then, do you foresee any basic change in in what in in what country in what countries do as far as <laughs> conflict is concerned? This is a beautiful question. Do you think anything's going to change, or it's is a human very, nature? Very very large question. Uh, people better qualified than I to address it, I think are saying that in spite of, of the violence that we see, that there's a change in the nature of violence. That's, that's clear. And perhaps there's, co contrary to general impressions, perhaps there's a reduction in the number of people suffering or killed from violence. Uh, I think, I think what this, to, to me, one of the bottom lines clearly is that, that when people have something to live for, that is a job, a decent income, they're not interested in war anymore. That's why, if you look at the members of Congress and their families in the Korean War, when we had a draft. I, I think there was one or none member of any f congressman's family, I don't, maybe I have this wrong, who actually served in the military in the K Korean War. I'm not sure that that's true, uh, but that, I think that's not far off. <clears throat> in other words, uh, in the Vietnam War again, uh, people who had money to go to school or do something, uh, they didn't have to go. Uh, I think, I think uh, people see this, and in other words, when you, when you have life chances, and you have the 
the self-respect that money helps bring, a job, your own home, and so forth, then people who have that don't want war. Mm -hmm. The people who, the people that were yapping about all the time, the terrorists on our side and the other side are people who are, who don't have life chances, basically. They have nothing to live for. So they're willing to go out and die for something mm -hmm. to a large extent, not exclusively. I wanted um, this just just a, I guess this is more of like a chronological housekeeping. I know that you you grew up in Iowa and you went to school in Iowa. When did you come to Illinois? Uh, I I came to Illinois because I had a a good offer from this top university. <laughs> this one here. Uh, Illinois in 1963 and 4. Okay. And uh, by that time I had worked my way up to being an as assistant professor in the University of Iowa. And I was beginning to publish and so at that time it was difficult to find Teachers even more more difficult than it is now. So that's when that's when you came to the University of Illinois. Correct. And you began teaching, even though you weren't crazy about teaching I, earlier. I uh, when I retired, I said, "Well, finally, three years before I retired, I learned how to how to be a good teacher." I was half serious when I said that. Uh, I think that I've always had trouble of being too intellectual and and uh, expecting my students to to catch on too fast. They've told me that over and over. Uh, not paying enough attention to the necessity of, of being entertaining as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I finally learned that late in my career. Uh, and certainly they don't teach you that in edu education <laughs> colleges. And when, yes, pardon me. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say when I did high school, practice teaching in a high school as an undergraduate student, I just couldn't connect to the students. When did you, when did you retire? When did I retire? 1990. 1990. Okay. So you've been, um, it's over 40 years that you've been here in, here in Champaign-Urbana. That's correct. Okay. And your time opposing the Vietnam War was also here. Correct. Yeah, I stood up down by the uh, down by the statues, <laughs> the alumni statues. Okay. The, That's uh, where we used to stand up to the alma mater. Yeah, alma mater. Okay. That's where we used to stand up with the get out of Vietnam sign. Mm. Well, I think that wraps up the questions I had. I want to know if there are any particular areas that you wanted to talk about. That oh I heavens, had. I've. I've uh, said too much about too many things, and I appreciate your help in ar arranging and s preparing me for this interview and doing the interview. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Tabor, thank you. <laughs> that was about an hour and a qu hour and three quarters, Oof. maybe an hour and forty. I wouldn't have believed it was possible, oh. but uh, it's. It's a, it's a, I, it's your interviewing, I have to say. Well, if I were left to tell a 